Okay, so it seems to be a, a, um, a good pause. Okay, so at this um, stage, welcome to everyone to today's R1 Mesopotamian uh, lecture series. And it's a great pleasure to introduce our speaker, our speaker Dan Calderbank. In fact, I'll be handing over to do that. Um, but first of all, I want to say that, that Dan is, is a, 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 an old friend of mine. We worked together actually at Tel Hyber uh, in southern Iraq. I was there one season. It's a very great pleasure to, to see these results pre presented and also what great heights Dan himself has moved on to. Uh, I also want to introduce uh, Nancy Highcock, who is uh, acting in the role of co-chair of this talk. Um, uh, not only because she's a great archaeologist, but I'm speaking to you from Iraq, and there's always the possibility of an interruption in the internet coverage, though I hope it doesn't happen. So Nancy is the Mesopotamian curator uh, in the British Museum, a colleague of mine in the Middle East Department, and I'll now hand over to Nancy to uh, formally introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. Dan Calderbank. Hi, thanks so much, John. Um, so welcome everyone today, and I have the, the pleasure of, of introducing our speaker. Um, so Daniel Calderbank is a British Academy postdoctoral fellow in the archaeology of the ancient Near East at the University of Glasgow. His special interest lies in the everyday crafts of middle to late Bronze Age Mesopotamia, the manufacture, use, and discard of objects, and the ways that these activities articulated with small scale social practices and with long term processes of state formation. These aims guided his Chen Operatoire analysis of the Tel Hyber pottery assemblage during his PhD studies at the University of Manchester, recently published in 2021, and continues to drive his postdoctoral research into craft engagements in historically unstable periods and marginal political spaces. So with that, Dan, um, I will mute myself and hand it over to you. Okay, thanks so much, Nancy, and thank you to John as well for inviting me to speak today. It's a real pleasure to talk about um, the First Sealand Dynasty, um, which is a little known state that emerged during the mid second millennium BCE in the uncertain transitional period between the Middle and Late Bronze Ages. So today I'm going to be discussing the Sealand period in light of recent excavations at the site of Tel Heba in southern Iraq whose architecture, textual ar archive, material culture are proving transformative, really, fundamentally challenging our traditional perceptions of social and political collapse for this middle late to late Bronze Age period. So just to start with, um, here on this slide, we've got a pretty basic timeline of the second millennium BCE in Mesopotamia, which is running across the top of the slide. And before we start to discuss the historical context of the Sealand period, I just want to re recap very briefly on what came before and what also comes afterwards. So up until approximately 1790 BCE, power over the Mesopotamian plains had been fragmented by intercity rivalries. During that time, the city of Babylon had been a kind of fairly insignificant power. But driven by the imperialistic will of King Hammurabi, Babylon conquered multiple cities in a short space of time and eventually achieved sovereignty over the whole of the alluvial plains, both north and south, stretching um, as far north, as far northwest as Mari up here, and then also as far south as the Gulf or where the ancient Gulf might have stretched to, which is around here. But also over certain territories up the Diyala River around here. And so when great power is gained so quickly, there's often a risk of overextension. And this appears to have been the case here, where Babylonian rule was under immense strain just a generation after Hammurabi, under his successor Samshuluna. The sites of the south began to rebel against this centralized control. And this brutal treatment appears to have been have been particularly keenly felt. So the, the, the um, reaction of Samshu Luna against the southern sites once they rebelled it seem, it seems to have been particularly keenly felt at the city of Ur, where Woolley describes the destruction in typically vivid detail. He says then, and I quote, not only were the great walls of defense dismantled so that no one brick was left upon another, but the whole city was given over to fire and destruction of its public monuments, not one was left and even the houses of the private citizens were involved in the common overthrow. 
But alongside these kind of external actions were also internal systemic issues that have been bubbling up for quite some time. Elizabeth Stone has discussed the increasingly dramatic polarization of land and wealth within the hands of an economic elite and the strain that this placed on state and society. Furthermore, and more recently, Seth Richardson has discussed the militarization of the countryside through the construction of rural forts in strategic border zones in the late old Babylonian period, which over time became loci of rebellion, turning against the centralized state and becoming dissidents, points of, re of rebellion. But whatever the ultimate reason, all of the traditional cities of the alluvial plains, um, many of which have been occupied continuously for a thousand years or more, so Ur, Lhasa, Lagash, Gersu and Uruk, um, were seemingly abandoned by 1650 BCE. So by the time Babylon itself finally fell to a Hittite raid in 1595, its territory had withered to little more than the city and its immediate hinterlands. Approximately two centuries after this abandonment period, the southern cities of the southern cities, and just over a century after the fall of Babylon itself, many of these cities were resettled under a new ruling dynasty, centered at Babylon, that of the Kassites. This group is considered to have come into Babylonia in several migratory waves from the east. Sometimes Kassites were presented as an organized invading force most notably during the reign of Samshua Luna, who claimed to have ripped out the roots of Kassite troops at Kikala, a location somewhere southeast of Babylon. But it's also clear from late old Babylonian sources that Kassite individuals and groups were also well integrated within the Babylonian state, occasionally in high ranking positions. So this presents the Kassites in a really kind of complex position during the Middle Bronze Age um, and late old Babylonian society. And then their royal accession in the late Bronze Age remains more than a little mysterious. But by the time of the Armana letters in the mid 14th century, Kassai rulers had secured such power over Babylonia that they could assert themselves on the international scene too, as equals to the Egyptian pharaoh. So what we can see on this slide is more of an archeological visualization of the historical narrative that I've just given. Um, with the sites of the Mesopotamian plains listed across the bottom of these two graphs, and then um, their stratigraphic sequences represented by the green and orange shading running vertically. And so what you can see is stratig stratigraphic evidence for discontinuous occupation. Almost all of the sites across the alluvial plains um, were settled in a until approximately 1720 or 1650 BCE, and it was then followed by a period of abandonment before most sites are seemingly reoccupied from about 1450 or 1400 onwards. So I just want to ignore the blue shaded bits for now because these are the potential um, periods of occupation for the site of Tel Heba, which I'll get into in a bit, and just focus on that grey period in the middle, that period of occupation of hiatus. So this is in between these two periods, it's a site of no, where we have no well stratified archaeological evidence. It's a period which has widely been referred to as a time of mass de urbanization and more dramatically as the onset of a Mesopotamian Dark Age. So the term Dark Age makes, makes you picture kind of complete social breakdown, leading to calamitous scenes such as these on the slide. But we know historically that periods of so-called collapse are rarely, if ever, complete social failures. Instead, they're often periods of social, cultural or political reconfiguration. They can be, as Norman Yoffe has recently put it, an age of opportunity. So what is it that happened in this in-between period, in this middle to late Bronze Age transition in Mesopotamia? So this is something that has traditionally been pieced together quite flimsily over a number of decades from just a few controversial chronicles, such as the Agam Kakrim inscription or the Epic of Golkisar, as well as the Babylonian king lists. What these sources tell us is that a dynasty of 11 kings of the sea land emerged during this dark age in the south of Iraq. Yet the sources provide only superficial detail on the jostling for power between these sea land kings and those of the first Babylonian dynasty and the emerging Kassite state. So notable synchronisms do occur, 
including the clashes between the first Sealand king, Iluma Ilu, and, the, and King Samshu Aluna, when Samshu Aluna dammed the Tigris and Euphrates rivers in a failed attempt to capture the Sealand king. Then we hear about territorial expansion by perhaps the most famous Sealand ruler, Gulkisar, who clashed with the final old Babylonian king, Samshu Ditana. Finally, we then hear of the Sealand ultimately succumbing to a Kassite military expansion into the south of Babylonia under Kassite king Ulamburiash, with the final king of the Sealand, Eyagamil, fleeing to Elam. So what this has given us is a kind of skeleton of a dynastic and political history of the Sealand, which we've, we've had for approximately a century now. Um, but it's taken a long time for us to actually add any sort of flesh to these bones. And until very recently, we've been at a loss to understand the inner workings of the Sealand state, or even to recognize its material culture. And in the late 2000s, things got a little bit kind of controversial in this, in this respect, when a collection of about 500 looted tablets from an unknown source surfaced in a private collection in Oslo called the Shoyan Collection. Stephanie Daly took the decision to translate and publish um, these tablets, and Odette Bovan has more recently conducted a more comprehensive and in-depth in study of their importance. Date formulas in this archive link the tablets directly to the seventh and eighth kings of the Sealand, Peshgel Daramesh and Ayadaragalama. Not only this, but they provide economic information on the tr transformation and circulation of a number of goods, in particular beer, oil and animal carcasses, around, which were moving around a palace complex, a palace which may well have gone by the name Karshamash. So some texts also make reference to members of the royal family, to courtiers and even to meals prepared directly for the king's table. So overall, these illicitly retrieved tablets provided the first concrete evidence that not only did the Sealand and its series of kings actually exist, but so too did a complex palatial economy, a significant scribal tradition, and a religious pantheon that focused on several traditional Mesopotamia city gods, those of Lhasa, Uruk, Nippo, and Babylon, cities which were at this point ostensibly abandoned. So I should say at this point that for anyone who wants a more detailed historiography of the First Sealand Dynasty, I'd point you towards Odette Bovan's recent book, um, where she provides a comprehensive and really well-balanced evaluation of the extant sources. But I want to go back now to looking a little bit at the landscape of the Sealand. So to understand how it's possible for this series of kings to break off from Babylonian control, we must first understand the natural environment, environment of, of this region. So today, the alluvial plains of the south of Iraq are mostly a vast expanse of flatlands interrupted only by the Tigris and Euphrates rivers and by the rising outlines of ancient settlement mounds. But in the very south of the region um, is a very different landscape. So there's a landscape of wetlands, marshes and lakes, which form where the Tigris and Euphrates come together before draining into the Gulf. So people familiar with Wilfred Fessiger's or Gavin Maxwell's ethnographies of the 1950s will know a lot about this unique landscape and the culturally distinctive Madan communities who continue to live in these areas. But the extent of these marshlands has changed a lot over this time, owing to climate change and also to human intervention. In particular, since Saddam Hussein drained many areas of the marshlands in the 1990s, leaving vast areas dry and desolate. So today, only small pockets of these marshes actually survive, and these are located well to the south of Ur and the modern city of Nazaria. So in the mid-second millennium, the Gulf itself may well have reached much further inland, uh, much closer to the city of Ur, and the marshes, both seasonal and permanent, appear to have been at a high water point, perhaps stretching as far northwest as Uruk. So the importance of the marshland landscapes um, as a naturally defensible territory can really be overstated. They provide refuge for individuals and groups dissident to the central state to hide out, and it's remarkably difficult not to say dangerous to march armies into landscapes such as these, 
particularly if one is not familiar navigating them. So this particular landscape, this unique landscape, allowed the Sealand dynasty a natural refuge in which to escape, develop, and ultimately thrive. So on the slide here, we have a reconstruction of the landscape of southern Babylonia in the Sealand period, covering an area to the south of Uruk, indicating the areas of lakes, marshlands, and prominent waterways. So this was created by a colleague Abdullami al-Hamdani, and today, most of this region is now almost completely dry and arid, and this allowed Abdul Amir Hamdani to lead archaeological surveys in the mid-2000s. Hamdani claims to have identified about 500 sites in this region, um, which potentially date to the period of sea land control to the middle to late Bronze Age transition. Over 300 of these are less than four hectares in size and were bunched along ancient canalways or unnatural humps in the landscape that would have risen above the marshes. Hamdani has argued that the inhabitants of these southern marshes formed a dispersed power base or indeed a shadow state on the fringes of Babylonian control. But just one of Abdul Amir Hamdani's 500 identified sites has since been excavated in real detail. And that's Telheba. And so Telheba was excavated during several field seasons between 2013 and 2017 by the Ur Region Archaeology Project and the, and, and the University of Manchester, and was directed by Stuart Campbell, Jane Moon, and Robert Killick. So this site is the first to ever produce extensive stratified material culture associated with the time of the first Sealand dynasty and is therefore transformative for our, understandings of the, our understanding of this period. So we know the date of the site based because of several dates from tablets in Tel Haber's archive, which can be associated with the eighth Sealand king, Aya Daragalama. This links the Tel Haber archive to the exact same king as those on, prov on provenance Shoyan tablets. So somewhere in the middle of the 16th century BCE, in that gray area of deurbanization, and a couple of generations after the fall of Babylon. So Tel Haber is located just 20 kilometers northwest of Ur. And if we move, and you can see that on the regional map on the left of the screen. And if we move from that wider regional map, to Abdul Amir Hamdani's survey map in the top right. I've circled the location of Tel Haber there too. And so as you can see, it's located um, in the heart of the ancient marshlands, surrounded by clusters of small, potentially contemporary sites, and sits along a prominent branch of canal known as the Eridu Canal. So if we zoom in even further to this satellite image at the bottom right of the screen, we can see that this branch of the canal is visible in the aerial imagery. And so you can see it running up here to the northeast face of, of the site of Tel Haber, and it ultimately joins up with an ancient course of the Euphrates. So excavations at Tel Haber have revealed a remarkable architectural complex. The site is dominated by this enormous rectangular structure, about 85 by 55 meters in plan. The exterior is flanked by highly defensible mud brick perimeter walls, that are about three meters thick and are punctuated regularly on all four sides by hollow projecting towers. The building has two main parts and so the southern unit, so this area here, and also which, which consists of a clearly organized plan with a central courtyard and several surrounding rooms, including the administrative suite that housed the site's tablet archive. So that's these rooms in the very southeast of the building here. And then we have the northern unit of the site, which is a larger, slightly later expansion added to the northeast. So this large section of the building here. And in this area, we have firstly a series of standardized rectangular rooms running along the eastern wing of the building. And this is coupled with a more fluid architectural layout in the central area of the building. So two techniques of excavation were employed at Tel Haber, and that's horizontal excava excavation, so surface scraping of the upper 10 to 30 centimeters of the building to reveal the entire architectural plan, and then vertical excavation, 
So stratigraphic exposure of specific rooms and areas to help understand the building's phasing and use. And so vertical excavation was limited to just a few areas of the building, which are shaded in darker gray on this plan. And so you can see large areas of the southern unit and then selective spaces in the northern unit that were selected for comprehensive excavation. And you can see both excavation techniques at play in both of these um, aerial images. And so horizontal excavation and surface scraping here and vertical excavation in areas like this. But I think a much more powerful and accessible image of the building scale is presented by this stylized 3D model created by my colleague Mary Shepperson. So this reconstruction is based on the width of the remaining walls, which suggests an original height of about 10 to 15 meters. So you can judge this scale compared to the little chap that we have perched on the very southern tip of the, of the building in this tower here. And you can see the scale of the building in comparison to, to that person. And so to me, this image provides a really fantastic perspective on how imposing the edifice of the building would have been in the surrounding marshlands. It would have been firstly function, functionally defensible and secondly, ideologically powerful. And in a recent article for The Guardian, Mary Shepperson likened the fortified building at Tel Haber to a medieval castle where in times of trouble, the communities of the surrounding area, so in this case, along the nearby marshes and waterways, might have sought sanctuary within its walls. But I should say that the building didn't start off life at this scale. It was, an orig it was originally just the standalone southern unit, so about 50 by 30 meters. So you can see in the bottom left here, um, and here it had a central courtyard, but instead of being flanked by the administrative suite in that row, in that area of the building, it was actually um, a row of vaults instead, subterranean vaults um, in the southeast corner of the building. And so you can see these vaults on excavation in the bottom right of the slide and a potential reconstruction by Mary Shepperson at the top right of the slide. But fairly soon after the southern unit was built, significant renovations took place which destroyed many traces of this original function. The vaults were removed and the architectural layer was overhauled. And it was at this point that the northern extension was added, which almost tripled the total size of the building. So here again is the plan of the building at its ultimate size in phase two, with both southern and northern units included. But I, what I really want to emphasize on this slide at the tightly controlled points of access. And so the single entrance to the building in the very north here, and then the central corri corridor running down here to link with a single entrance to the southern unit here, and then just two corridors running off right near the entrance to go to the east of the building and the west. Then what we also have are niches next to the main entrance way, so these two here, and these down here, which were probably, should probably be interpreted as guard rooms potentially. Again, emphasizing that um, entrance to the building and movement around the building was potentially tightly controlled. What we have on the right hand side of the slide is a visibility analysis. And the colors that you can see represent, the warmer colors represent high visual integration. And so the areas of the building that are most visible from different areas um, and different sides, and the cooler colors are the ones that are the least visible or have the least area of visibility. And what we can see is that this is very much, the, the higher areas of visibility are very much restricted to the central corridor and the courtyard at the bottom, whereas the wings of the building are very much more difficult to access visually and potentially much more difficult to access physically. And so the visibility analysis might to some extent match up with the accessibility of these areas as well. So there are currently no precise architectural parallels for Tel Haber's fortified building. It seems to represent a kind of complex amalgamation of various second millennium architectural traits from both before and after the Sealand period. 
The southern unit on its own resembles fortified towers, which have been found elsewhere in Mesopotamia. For example, a middle Assyrian Tel Sabi Abiad, which is pictured, the plan of which is pictured in the bottom right. So these forts, which are known as Dimtu or Donu, um, were common um, from the old Babylonian period onwards as a way of militarizing the countryside. Mm -hmm. We know, for example, that King Samshua Luna and especially Amasaduka built a number of such forts, some of which appear to have turned rebellious to the centralized Babylonian state. But the Tel Haber building was not designed purely for defense. The layout of the southern unit with its large central courtyard surrounded by rooms resembles wealthy private residences of the early second millennium. While the suite of standardized rectangular rooms on the eastern flank, so these here, um, share similarities, far more similarities to rooms from known palaces, such as the Palace of Zimri Lim at Mari, where you can see these rooms here, which have been interpreted as, um, as rooms for palace employees. So the texts also support the suggestion that Tel Haber's building was about more than defense. The archive of 150 tablets, which have been analyzed by Eleanor Robson, fall into several key genres, most of which are administrative, so numerical lists, tabular accounts and payment records, and some of which are letters and mem memoranda, as well as a couple of fragmentary school exercises too. So most of the archive is concerned with the small scale and relatively inform informal circulation of cereal products, some of which were sent on from Tel Haber to a palace of some description. Eleanor Robson has remarked that the archive appears to reflect a, re a fairly light touch administrative apparatus at Tel Haber, one which loosely tied a community of laborers within a palatial economic system. So about 30 different professions were attached to the fortified building, uh, many of which you can see listed on the slide here. So we, there's leather workers, reed workers, plowmen, farmers, courtyard sweepers, carpenters, smiths, royal auxiliary troops, cooks, shepherds, laborers, scribes and bird catchers. And so a, a vast diversity of different professions that are at least to some extent associated with the fortified building. And Eleanor Robson characterizes this local population as, and I quote, a dispersed, mostly rural community who are pressed into agricultural service at harvest time, whether through a formal obligation, moral pressure to serve the community, or the incentive of payment. So what's really fascinating about this is that several of the individuals which are listed um, in the tablets, including a shepherd, at least one leather worker, and perhaps several carpenters, pop up not only in this archive, but also in that illicitly looted Shoyan collection that I discussed earlier. So this supports not only the parallel dating of the two archives, but also the significant economic and geographic proximity and overlap. So perhaps that palace of the Sealand Kings that's mentioned in the Shoyan collection might well be tantalizingly close by to Tel Haver. So we have a range of different objects that belong to the various people associated with the building, bronze weaponry for the troops, as well as cylinder seals related to record keeping. We also have a range of more personal possessions, including a bronze mirror, bed models, anthropomorphic figures, several typical Babylonian plaques, and even a rattle, which was maybe a child's toy. And individually, these objects offer really wonderful personal stories. They're the stuff of Sealand society and state, and together speak to the vibrancy and diversity of the activities which took place in and around the fortified building. But primarily, my personal interest um, lies and expertise as well, lie with the pottery. And so it's only right that I spend a bit of time today talking about Tel Haber's ceramic assemblage. So in, in four seasons of work at Tel Haber, I processed approximately 9,000 diagnostic shirts, so rims, bases, and decorated shirts, as well as over 400 complete or near complete vessels dated to the Sealand period. Together, this represents one of the most extensive assemblages of Mesopotamian pottery that's ever been systematically recorded 
and is an enormous resource for understanding Telhaber on multiple different scales, both in and around the site itself, but also on the regional scale too, which we'll get onto in a bit. So just to give you a sense of where we stand in terms of the ceramic assemblage, here are some fairly typical typological figures that we get for second millennium pottery, um, which are usually made by James Armstrong or, and Herman Gash. And a bunch, what we get here are a bunch of similar looking pots, which are organized according to two key variables um, of space and time. And what's immediately clear from just looking at, at these figures on the slide is that there's a developmental gap in the middle of the second millennium, which simply reads de-urbanized. And this is precisely the period into which Telhaber's vessels fit. So the main vessel families we have at Telhaber are these small carinated bowls, um, footed cups such as this one, and slightly larger jugs, all of which were presumably used for food and drink consumption. Then we also have small rounded bottles such as this one, and measuring vessels, cylindrical beakers like this. Um, sometimes they're plain and sometimes they have incised decoration running along the body like that. Um, then of the larger vessels, we get cup pots, such as this one, often heavily used and fragmented. We get baggy shaped jars, like this one here, uh, bulky pifoy, such as this one in the middle, and then pifoy with holes in the base, um, which were used as brewing vats. And so it's these larger vessels, so the jars, pifoy, and cup pots in particular, um, which showed the most resilience in shape from what came before in the old Babylonian period. So this assemblage represents what seems to be a localized and chronologically specific manifestation of what is a broader second millennium pottery tradition, one that consisted of a limited set of plain undecorated vessel types of a standardized appearance. But while the larger ves vessels show strong shape similarities, the tablewares, so bowls, cups, and jugs, um, such as these, show a bit more fluctuation in shape through time. So these are far more characteristic of the Sealand period. So for Telhaber's bowls, the main difference is the carinated body and vertical orientation of the rim, compared with the straight-sided and flaring bowls of the old Babylonian period, or indeed the wavy-sided bowls of the Kassai period. There's also the introduction in the Sealand period of bowls with grooves directly beneath the rim. So this one here. Cups from Telhaber are also quite different. So although they show a general similarity in their overall shape, they do not have the long elaborate necks common in the earlier and later periods. There is also the addition of unstable footed cups in the Sealand period, such as those at the bottom of the screen. So these ones here. And these aren't common in other second millennium assemblages in the region, which usually have either flat disc bases or taller flaring feet, such as this one here. But crucially, these are the key diagnostic features of a Sealand period assemblages. And as you can see, it's, it's kind of a subtle difference between each of these different stages. And it's this subtlety that might well have contributed to these vessels being overlooked or miscategorized during archeological survey and excavation in the region previously. So just to focus on some of these particular vessels a little bit more, some of the most common vessels a little bit more, um, what we see is a, a good amount of intentional standardization in the manufacture of some of Telhaber's pots. And um, so we can see, for example, if we look at the shape of bowls on the slide here, that there's an intention on the part of the potter or the potters to standardize their vessel shapes. Every single one of these bowls and of the, the bowls found at Telhaber are flat bases, inverted bodies with sharp curves or carinations just below a plain rim. So of all the 25 complete bowl profiles from Telhaber, all of them share these features. And we can see this on the right hand side of the slide where we brought together all of the profile drawings um, of these vessels and brought them down to the same scale to really capture the similarities in those features. And the same can be seen for 66 complete cups from Telhaber, uh, where there's, there is one 
basic difference in style to note between cups. And that's that about half of them have a stable foot, which you can see on the left of the slide, in that they can stand on their own without support. And the other half have unstable feet, which would topple over without support. Other than that, they all have rounded bodies with a clear defined neck that is concave in profile and has a simple rounded rim. Each individual example, although differing slightly in its overall makeup, all share these same shape characteristics. So there was a clear mental template in the potter's mind when they produced bowls, cups and other vessels um, for use at Tel Heba. And that mental template was no doubt governed by deeply embedded traditions of vessel use. So this assemblage was designed to be functional, no frills, a utilitarian assemblage. It consists of vessels that would have been used for the usual range of food related activities. So cooking, brewing, measuring of dry and liquid goods, storage of bulk goods and more special items such as perfumes and oils. And finally, in the everyday serving and consumption of food and drink. No sea land period vessels from Tel Heba are inherently high status as we would normally judge them by archeological parameters. So there's no discernible fineware traditions at play at Tel Heba, no elaborately decorated vessels and no vessels of kind of unusual shapes that were clearly used for specific, maybe ritual purposes. So the same functional vessel shapes and styles were found all over the building. So vessels were imported to the fortified building in bulk, seemingly at periodic, perhaps seasonal intervals. And we know this from a couple of fragmentary numerical accounts, which provide receipts for at least nine different vessel types received in different quantities by the site's administration. It's often di very difficult to reconcile vessel names directly from the text with archaeological vessel types found during excavation. And this is something that I discuss in much more detail in, in a recent article. Um, so it's at the bottom of the slide there, what's in a vessel's name. Um, but I don't, I don't want to go into too much detail here. So after weighing up numerous different factors, what we can begin to do is make informed associations between um, textual and archaeological sources. And what this tell us, what these tell us is that just below half of the imported vessels to Tel Heba appear to have been for eating and drinking purposes. So we get 160 cups of two different types, so the Lermu and the Lachanu. We have 50 bowls of two types, the Kalu and Kabkaru, and 30 jugs, which are known as the Kukabu. The rest of the imports were storage vessels, 290 jars of two different types. Kaptoku and Kalparu, and 10 Pifoi, which were known as Danitu. But to understand where these vessels ended up and how they were used once they arrived at Tacheba, we must conduct a distributive analysis. And this kind of distributive analysis can help us to understand how everyday life actually unfolded across the different excavated spaces of the building. So I'm going to start this kind of brief distributive analysis um, kind of close to the main entranceway. So the main entrance is here. And then as soon as you enter the building, um, there's this corridor off to the east wing leading to this set of rooms in the northeast corner. And it seems as though these few rooms in the northeast corner seem to have been used for craft activities. And so what we found here in room 156 was a brewing installation which consisted of a large vat with a hole in the base called a kakalu on Namsi 2 vessel. And this was upturned directly next to a cylindrical vessel stand with a closed base, which was used to support the beer vat and to collect runoff. Two cups were found alongside, presumably used either for adding ingredients or for skimming off excess surface debris during the fermentation process. So this area of the site may well have been the workplace of the brewer, who is listed in Tel Heba's archive, a man named Manu Bala Ilishu. Directly next door to room 156, um, we found a bronze shaft or lads nestled inside a bronze bowl. So perhaps the products or else the tools of the smith, who is also mentioned in the archive. A ceramic mold, which was lined with um, copper residue, was found nearby, which is a further suggestion that this area of the building was reserved for these various craft activities. So 
So wait a second. So further along this eastern corridor from room 156, um, what we have is an excavated room 101. And on the right of the screen is a detailed plan of room 101 with the precise find locations of all complete pottery vessels indicated by these stylized illustrations. And in this room, we recovered a group of cups, bowls and jugs, which were scattered in the southern corner. And a recent uh, proteomic analysis of one of these cups actually found signatures for soybean proteins. And so the earliest recorded evidence for soy in Western Asia. And this is something, the impact of this, we're only starting to think through at the moment. And alongside these vessels was a high concentration of cooking wares, such as this um, large cooking pot that you can see at the top of the slide, um, as well as a makeshift grinding basin down here, which was used to the point of breakage. In the northern corner was a domed tenor oven used for baking bread. And so essentially room 101 had all of the equipment necessary for kind of quite rudimentary domestic occupation by a small group of individuals. And one of these individuals may well have carried amongst their possessions this ceramic plaque of a female worshipper, which you can see up here on the slide. But room 101 represents just one excavated example in a row of 11 standardized rectangular rooms, each of which had a tenor oven in the very same place, right in the northern corner of each room. So, oops, skipping forward. So we might therefore view these rooms as a series of lodgings. Shepperson hypothesizes that each room could conceivably have slept up to 10 adult individuals, and she drew a stylized picture of how she might actually see this playing out and um, kind of these 10 people crammed in. So this is a maximum of 10 people. So these could therefore have been used as barracks for the Royal Auxiliary Troops who are mentioned in the site's text or else temporary accommodation for travelers or merchants who moved along the canal network that ran by the site. Or they could have been lodgings for attached laborers or craftspeople and their families who carried out their work in the building. So move into a different part of the building now, um, just off the central courtyard in the center of the building, um, close to the entrance to the southern unit. So you can see on the main plan here at the top and then close uh, kind of zoomed in view here with the, with the stylized pots. And what we get here appears to be, have been a room that was largely dedicated to conspicuous consumption of liquids. And so in room 142, in what room 142, sorry, a group of about 15 cups and jugs were found alongside small bottles and measure, measuring vessels. These measuring vessels were elaborately decorated with wavy lines and impressions and were presumably used for doling out drinks, like perhaps, perhaps beer. And so this collection of vessels were sat on a unique reed laid floor, which is remarkably well preserved. As you can see in this picture in the center of the slide, you can see this remarkable preservation of this reed laid matting. And at the, on the east side of this room, we have this preserved mud brick bench that sat alongside this reed laid mat. And so what this reminded me of on excavation, um, were the reed mats found in the homes and also the communal modif dwellings in the marshlands of Iraq today. These modifs, uh, especially, modifs especially the communal modifs, are fundamentally social spaces where personal relationships are negotiated and consolidated over the consumption of food and drink. And the importance of this room, room 142, to the people of Tel Haba, might be suggested by the final excavated phase of sealand occupation here, where a pit was dug in the very centre of the room and a cache of drinking vessels were deposited before being partially covered by a painted piffos shirt. This deposit might mark some sort of ceremonial closing event, a mark perhaps of the deep social memories which were tied to this space. So now we're moving into the southern unit and so we're moving into the administrative suite of rooms in the very southeast corner of the building. And here, first and foremost, um, we have the tablet archive, which was sp found spread across two main rooms, which is room 300 and room 309. 
Room 300 also features, features a large round clay bin pictured on the slide. So this here, this round clay bin, about 75 centimeters in diameter. So this bin was probably used, it was surrounded by small tablets and tablet fragments. And it seems that it was probably used as a repository where redundant tablets could be soaked and recycled, ready for reuse um, by the scribe. Another intriguing find in these rooms was a bitumen smeared storage jar, which was etched on the exterior surface with a pot mark, which you can see on the right hand side of the slide. And so this here, this partial pot mark. And it's kind of unclear what this partial inscription precisely designates, but similar linear inscriptions have been found on pots from the Gulf, as well as on a couple um, of, of tablets in the Shoyan collection, we get inscriptions on the edges of a couple of those tablets. So these have recently been interpreted by David Hamidovich as the remnants of a possible early alphabetic script. So it's therefore possible that a more informal script coexisted at the site alongside the official cuneiform of the Tel Hebra tablets. So across the courtyard from the administrative suite um, was a room, room 316, which seems to have specialized in intensive cooking activities. Here, an almost complete cooking vessel was found in situ close to a smaller cooking vessel. Then we have a couple of large jars, which were also found, which were surrounded by a concentration of fish bones, possibly indicating the storage and cooking of dried or salted fish. And nearby were found a couple of small bottles and measuring vessels, which were presumably used in association with oils or spices in cooking. We also have a fragment of a beautifully made grinding basin, uh, which was also found in this room. This vessel was embedded with sharp angular grits on the interior surface, which would have been perfect for grinding grain. And the resulting flour was then baked into bread in several tanner ovens, which were located both just inside the room, but also just outside in the adjacent courtyard. Also a fragment of what appears to be a ceramic bread mold, which you can see in the bottom right, perhaps indicates the baking of more specialized bread products in this room. So these cooking activities may well have been overseen by the new Hatimu, three professional cooks who are listed in the site's tablet archive. So the final room that we're gonna look at in this distributive analysis is the so-called reception room which was a long rectangular room just south of the central courtyard, which was possibly the seat of the mayor when in residence. Directly outside the entrance to this room was an enormous toppled stone basin that you can see pictured here. And so this was by far the biggest piece of worked stone that we found at the site. And it may well have been used for washing the hands or the face before entering the reception room. Inside the room, the only high status materials recovered were two stone vessels pictured in the top left, one a small closed vessel, the other a large open bowl. Alongside these were scattered numerous small cups and bowls, which were indicative of the commensal feasting activities that probably took place in this room. So while there was clearly some aspect of ceremony that accompanied these feasting activities, there's no visual difference between the cups and bowls used in this room and those used in the rudimentary lodgings in the north of the building that we discussed earlier. The same material, especially in terms of the ceramics, the same material culture was found all over this building. So just in the last section today, I wanna kind of scale out from the, the small scale, the minutiae of the building itself and scale out towards um, the sea, sea land period on a regional scale. And so we've already discussed um, that the Shoyan Sea Land Archive references a number of major Mesopotamian cities. So it makes a reference to Ur, Uruk, Lhasa, Nippur, and suggests their continued importance during the Sea Land period, either as living settlements or as religious centers. So now that we have a better understanding of how we might recognize Sealand period material culture, it's worth seeing what other evidence might be lurking out there that has perhaps been overlooked previously. So it's possible to sift through the old field reports and pick out odd vessels, individual vessels, um, such as this carinated bowl from Uruk, or this jug from Nippo, 
for comparison. So even vessels from Babylon, such as the cup shown on the slide, match up really well with typical sea lands period shapes. And indeed, um, a colleague, Katya Schnernitzka, has looked at the ceramic assemblage um, in, in Berlin from Babylon and has tried to bridge that gap between the Middle and Late Bronze Age. But it's important to emphasize that these direct stylistic comparisons are really very rare at these traditional sites. And so, but if we look at woolly site reports, for instance, it's tempting to pick out vessel shapes that match precisely with typical unstable footed cups from Tel Haber. And you can see these on the very right hand side of the slide. So while a couple of vessels um, come from Ur itself, the most striking similarities come from a nearby mound called Umphazid. So I was recently looking through the new digital catalog for Ur, and I came across some new photographs of these vessels from Umphazid too, which you can see again on the right hand side of the screen. So this cup here and this pot stand here, which really show massively striking similarities with this cup here from Tel Haber and this pot stand here from Tel Haber. So this is by far the closest comparisons I've seen. And that material from Emphase, it definitely wouldn't have looked out of place at Tel Haber. So I, I did a, a little bit of a, a deeper dive um, through the Ur volumes. And it appears that Emphase, it was a mound very close to Ur that Woolley sent a group of workers to for just a few days. So Woolley's very vague about its precise location, and we only have a couple of bits of information to go off. One is that Umphazit is on the other side of the railway line from Tel Uved. And the second piece of information is that it is a mound about six miles north to northeast of Ur. So after a bit of snooping um, using the satellite imagery, sorry, using the satellite imagery, sorry, my computer's messing around a bit. Let's see if it, I've lost my cursor. And um, so anyway, after a little bit of um, snooping about with the satellite imagery, what I found is that there's a small mound that fits this particular profile very well. Um, and I hope one day if I get to go back to the south of Iraq and to Ur, to, uh, that I get to actually go and visit this site and have a snoop around. Um, but if anyone here does know of more information about the site of phase it, then please, please do, do tell me about it. Because with the, the seemingly significant downsized and fragmentation of communities across Babylonia during the Middle to Late Bronze Age, it's probably small sites like phase it, like Tel Heba, that hold the most potential in, in providing more of an understanding on the Sealand dynasty. And so the most extensive similarities to the Sealand period material from Tel Haber actually come from sites beyond Babylonia, further south in the Gulf, in the region known historically as Dilmun. And so the best comparative material comes from a site called Phylacar Island, located at the head of the Gulf, approximately 200 kilometers southeast of Tel Haber, as well as Kalat al Bahrain, another 400 kilometers further south than this. So Phylacher is an extremely important site for any study of the Sealand period, but it's often been overlooked due to its peripheral location. Phylacher is important because it was resettled precisely at the same time as the Sealand dynasty rose to power in southern Mesopotamia. Not only was it resettled in this period, but it was resettled with a distinct Mesopotamian feel to its material culture. And this can be seen in the sharp increase in Mesopotamian pottery styles, from just 2% of the assemblage in the old Babylonian period to 91% in the period between 1600 and 1475 BCE. So the main pottery types for period 3b of Thylaka are virtually identical to those vessels in use at Tel Haber, although produced mostly in local gold fabrics. And this is something that was pointed out for a long time by a colleague, um, Fleming Hoyland, um, but up until we found the material, the Sealand material from southern Mesopotamia, we couldn't actually um, have any proof that this material from Phylaka actually represented a Sealand period assemblage. 
So in line with these developments on Filaka was an ostensible revival of local royal authority on Bahrain as well. So at some time in the late 17th and early 16th centuries, a royal mound was constructed on, on the island and urban life returned to the town of Kalat al-Bahrain. Kalat demonstrates extensive use of the same typical Sealand period styles. And what's most fascinating is that these similarities of Filaka and at Kalat al-Bahrain are most visible in the tablewares. So those vessels that were used for serving, eating and drinking activities, which was so critical to cultural production. And these similarities in material culture and behavior may well have existed in the absence of a strong overarching state system. Both mundane and large scale customers of eating and drinking forged deep social and cultural ties between these dispersed communities. So fortified hubs such as Talhebra on the one hand and Gulf trading outposts such as Bailaka Island and, and Kalat al Bahrain on the other. The results may have been an alternative political structure that looked away from the traditional cities of Babylonia and was distributed throughout the marshlands and over the waterways of the Gulf. These cultural connections are not unique to the Sealand period. In Gavin Young's Return to the Marshes, written in the 1970s, Sheikh Said Abbas, describing his father's funeral, says the following. He says that 200,000 people came to my father's wake from Baghdad, Basra, Kuwait, even Bahrain. All the tribes came, of course, the Shagamba, the Fatus, the Suwaid. We killed dozens of sheep. And I think this passage encapsulates really well the ways that dispersed communities across this Gulf littoral zone could be mobilized by deeply embedded cultural traditions, such as feasting and funerary celebration. So just to bring some of this evidence together now, um, it's no longer appropriate to describe the Sealand period and the Middle late to Late Bronze Age more generally as a dark age or a period of collapse. It was a period of opportunity for building alternative political forms and so alternative socialities. Talheba demonstrates a period of material and scribal continuity and resilience, of adaptation and resistance, a period of military strategy and architectural grandeur on the one hand, with relative material austerity and light touch administration on the other. It was a time when fractious relationships with the North seemed to have led to the establishment of long distance economic and cultural connections stretching across the Gulf. Um, so there's still major strides to take in our understanding of the First Sealand Dynasty and the middle to late Bronze Age um, transition more generally but the possibilities will be far greater as long as we think about through the prism or away from the prism of collapse and allow for um, the possibility of atypical political structures and alternative socialities, such as we perhaps seen um, through the evidence from Talheba. And with that, I just want to say thanks a lot for listening and thanks to the entire Talheba team whose hard work I just happen to be the face of today. Thank you. Uh, well, Dan, uh, thank you very much indeed for a really uh, fascinating and superbly well-presented talk. And congratulations uh, to yourself and Mary uh, and Robert and Jane for the, the work that you put in with, and achieving such superb results. And I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of questions. I might start with just one. Uh, going back to Abdul Amir's surface survey and the distribution map that you showed, uh, to what extent will that map be changed by the refined understanding of the ceramics which you have now achieved? Um, well, I couldn't possibly answer that because I've, I've never had the chance to see the material that Abdul Amir was working with to create, to create this map and to interpret these sites as um, Sealand period sites. And so all I, all I can say is that future surveys in the region will have now a, an excavated assemblage and well stratified assemblage to go forward with um, to help identify these sites more readily, but also um, to help refine some of Abdul Amir's ideas. But it's not something that I've currently been able to do or to talk to Abdul Amir extensively about. 
uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, and to everyone who's uh, listening, participating, uh, if you put your questions uh, in the chat um, and then uh, we'll get to them uh, in due course. I um, want to now go to the linear inscription that you showed. H have you shown mm -hmm. that to experts in the Mediterranean linear scripts? Is there any input from that line? Um, no, I, I did get in touch with is it Philip Boyes, Boyles. I, I might be wrong here because this isn't my area of expertise, but I did get in touch and he he directed me straight back to David Hamidovich and said that uh, to contact him. He said it wasn't something that he recognizes as an early alphabetic script, but that's not to say that it isn't. So this is, is very early in that type of analysis. And so I presented it today as a possibility rather than an established um, idea. Yeah, a, a, a amazing uh, find, of course. Um, another thing I wanted to ask you about is that in the possible barracks rooms, uh, room one and one, 101 and so forth. Um, are, are there graves underneath the floor? Not in those rooms, no. No, we don't find any graves beneath the floor in those rooms. That was something that was fair. Actually, the, the, the burials inside the building were something that was restri restricted to the just post Sealand period. And so once the building had been abandoned, that's when we start to get the, um, the burials inside the building itself when the building was presumably abandoned and in potentially a state of ruin. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. That's interesting. Um, great. So we've got a question here from Constance uh, Manon Margofsky uh, concerning the tablets. Among the 150 tablets in the archive, were any of them sealed with seal impressions? And if so, uh, do you have any observations about that? Um, again, this isn't my field of expertise, so any specific questions should be directed at Professor Eleanor Robson. But to my understanding, no, none of them were, were, were had, had, seal, had, had seal impressions. Well, that, that raises another interesting point, of course, that you, you have this um, uh, fortified grain keeping centre and, and, of course, uh, security measures at the two gate systems. You would expect um, both maybe at those gates, but certainly at the storerooms for there to be doorknobs and ceilings and discarded ceilings. Have you found anything of that nature? No, no. Again, we went through, certainly at the start of excavations at Telhaber, we went through a very thorough process of sifting through all of the material to find any evidence that we could for um, fragmentary, poorly preserved seal impressions. And this is just something we, we don't have at the site. Well, that, that, that's very interesting uh, uh, absence uh, of, of evidence. Um, sticking with the um, uh, tablets, a question from uh, Nathan Steinmeier. Um, is there an estimate on when the text will be published? Um, that will depend, depend on the final publication of the Telhaber volume, which is in, in progress at the moment and is, as far as I'm aware, it's been brought together by Jane Moon and Robert Killick. And so I don't have an up-to-date um, absolute date on this, but it should hopefully be over the next year or so that it will be published. Well, we're all going to be uh, looking forward uh, to that. Um, so, of course, we, we've learned a huge amount about Tel Khyber and its importance in the local economy and the economy of, of the Sealand. Um, do, do you have theories as to what the capital of the Sealand state was? Um, no, I'm hesitant to, to, answer, to answer that question. It has had a, a few different um, suggestions in, in recent years. So the, this, the improvenance Shoyan collection makes reference regularly to a site called Kashamash, which a lot of logical interpretations have said that this site, Kashamash, was where um, this, where this, the Shoyan collection was actually looted from, wherever that is. We don't know exactly where it is, but judging by the connections with the Tel Haber archive, it must be somewhere in the vicinity, somewhere in between Tel Haber, um, or Lhasa, somewhere in that sort, of, so, that sort of area, presumably, but not necessarily. But then Abdul Amir Hamdani in his PhD thesis has proposed the site of Dehalia, which is a site in um, 
the Eridu Basin, close to Talheba, as a potential candidate for the Sealand capital, uh, based on ceramic surface collections and on the size of the site itself, but also the aerial imagery, which seems to show um, some really kind of centralized architecture, um, public, ar public architecture and ceremonial buildings, something similar to the Temenos at Ur. And so he has made the argument that the people from Ur potentially moved to Dehalia, and this was the Sealand capital. But this is very much up in the air, and that's just one suggestion of, of many. Excellent. Clearly uh, plenty for people to work with on in the future. Um, just a note on the tablets, uh, a note here from Stuart Campbell, of course, one of the senior members of the uh, hybrid expedition, that many of the texts are already uh, available in ORAC, so a seriologist and others um, can go and have a look there. Absolutely. Um, another, um, another question on the text. So um, you, of course, uh, painted a very interesting and detailed picture of what's happening in Tel Haib and its surroundings and the sea land. Um, to what extent do you think your understanding of the archaeology would have been diminished if we didn't have the information from the Skoyan collection? Hmm. Excellent question. Uh, of, of the archaeology would have been diminished or of the yeah. tablet? I think of the archaeology, uh, of course, I'm well aware of the, um, the different points of views in publishing um, uh, unsourced material, and the seriologists will argue till the, the, uh, till the cows come home. Um, but um, sticking to the archaeology, I was just wondering whether your interpretation of the archaeology was to some extent guided or shaped by the information in the Skoyan collection. I'd say not too much, no. No, we, we tended to be quite quite distance from that, especially because as the project starts off, we didn't know that we were excavating a Sealand period site. This is something that after um, the tablets, after Eleanor had worked with the tablets and what we got that date through, and we'd already been suspecting that our ceramic assemblage and the material culture didn't quite fit in with um, the old Babylonian date that we'd originally kind of considered as a possibility. And so we started to get an idea that this fitted into this transitional period, which was then confirmed by the tablets. But this was, I think our, our thinking from the start had been guided in a more isolated way. And it was only later that we started to, to look at the, the Shoyan collection. So I wouldn't say that it massively influenced, certainly not our archaeological work, how much it influenced the interpretation of the tablet archive. You can only ask Eleanor. Well, that's a, a pleasure I look forward to, uh, of course. Um, well, uh, on that note, I want to say that you've, you have made an, an excellent um, case of putting together the, the epigraphic evidence and the archaeological evidence, a very compelling, um, very exciting picture. Clearly, you've discovered a lot, and clearly there's much more um, to be discovered in the future. Um, so I want to say, again, uh, thank you very much for presenting this to all of us here um, in the um, uh, ARWA group. Actually, there's, there's one more question here. Uh, this is from, from Richard Beale. Um, do you have any evidence for dates? Uh, um, am I misinterpreting your phase one as having channels in the floor? Um, if so, could this have been made to make fermented date wine, as is still the case in Oman? That's from uh, Joanne Skurlock and Richard Beale. Yeah, a really interesting question. We've, we've so, so they are, they are vaults more than anything, this is how we've interpreted them. They are very well-made um, kind of mud brick architecture, um, it, mud brick vaults. Um, and so I'm not sure, I would have to talk personally with Richard about that, see if this fits into um, the kind of architecture that's normally used for, for date production such as this. But that's not something that we've, we've thought about as far as I'm aware, um, but we have been baffled by these vaults for a long time and exactly what their purpose was, um, because they don't seem to be particularly suitable for um, storage of grain, for example. And But whatever their purpose was, it seems to have been kind of not been too successful, because it was soon after that that the vaults were kind of uh, were, went out of use and the renovations took place. There was only a short period between that phase one architectural um, use of the building and the subsequent renovation 
of the southern unit and the addition of the northern unit. So whatever was going on in those vaults, it doesn't seem to have been particularly successful. Yeah, very, very really interesting, interesting question. Uh, another question actually now from uh, Nathan Steinmeier. Um, does your team or any other team have plans to excavate more sealand sites in the area in the near future, or are there actually any teams in the field now? There has been excavations at Dehalia, the sites that I mentioned earlier, that um, Abdul Amir interpreted as the potential capital of the sealand. There was a, a Russian team that has been working there for the last two seasons, just preliminary excavations. And so that has the potential to either shed light on whether it is an obviously land period site or else could provide a different narrative. So we'll see where that goes. Um, but at the moment, I'm not aware. I, I see Elizabeth Stone and, and Paul Zemanski are here and they excavated a site called Tel Sakaria, which is also, they've interpreted as sea land. I've not seen the ceramics from, from the site. And, and so I'd, I'd love to be able to compare material with them. And, but that's another site that's a potential sea land period site. So there's stuff happening. There are other potential candidates out there, but there's no plans certainly from us to excavate another in the near future. Uh, thank you. Uh, Elizabeth or Paul, would, would you like to comment on that at all? If so, do please uh, uh, unmute yourself. Yeah, I, I wouldn't call Tel Sakaria Sealand at all. And, and you, you dug this stuff yourself, John. Uh, uh, we basically there were confronted with a mound that was made out of almost pure clay. Uh, and the, the modest ceramics that we found on it um, were largely uh, uh, cassite. Uh, so I don't think it fills this period very well. I'm pretty sure it was abandoned by that time. The, the theory is that it was ancient Ga'esh and that this was essentially a, a platform on top of which there was old Babylonian or three material that was all pretty well washed off to the sides by the time we got there. So there's gonna be no salvation from there. But while, while I'm here, can I just ask an, another question that's off the point? I'm impressed by those nipple bases that you're getting. Uh, and they're absolutely characteristic of the middle Assyrian period and the, and the late Habur wares that we were finding in the North Jazeera. Do you see any connection there? Absolutely. It's not material that I know particularly well myself or have ever handled. And so I've only ever seen illustrations in, um, in, in um, field reports, which are not the easiest things to make comparisons um, on. But I definitely do see those similarities. And that's something I think needs to be explored a bit further, why those similarities do exist. So yeah, thank you for pointing that out, Paul. Uh, uh, thank you, Paul. And of course, Paul and Elizabeth, always a pleasure to see you. Um, are there any more questions for Dr. Calderbank? Right. Well, I have to say we, we, we've had a lot of questions, very interesting questions, very interesting answers. So um, uh, once again, let me say thank you to you, uh, Dan, for a superb talk, superb project and superb talk. Congratulations on that. Um, Thank you very much, and we wish you um, really well in the next phase of your research into the sea land uh, and in um, other projects. Um, so to everyone who has attended Dr. Colvin's talk, uh, thank you uh, very much indeed, uh, and we look forward to seeing you uh, at next month's uh, RR uh, lecture. So uh, good evening or afternoon to all of you uh, from here. Thank you, everyone. Hmm. Great. Thanks again, uh, uh, Dan and Nancy. Goodbye and um, uh, see you soon. Yep, glad your internet held up. <laughs> thank you so much, Absolutely. Dan, for the wonderful yeah. talk. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, John. And yeah, glad your internet held up, John. Nice one. Cool. Cheers. Bye. Bye.